And what I really feel strongly about is that there is a link between very ancient teachings, uh, Druidism, and <coughs> what they're teaching today in our schools, in some of our schools. Uh, so I just wanted to read a little bit from this book of uh, Druidism, which I just got in the post yesterday and managed to read extraordinarily uh, fast. But children were taken away from homes and educated many, many, many years ago. Um, Druids uh, educated all children of whatever station, not permitting their parents to receive them till they were 14 years of age. Thus the Druids were regarded as the real fathers of the people. I'm sorry you can't read this very clearly, but it says, what are the special links between the ancient mounds of Eton Winchester, Westminster, and Marlborough. There seem to be curious connections between these mounds. They're all connected to unique places of education. And each has a link with, and this is my point, leadership, kingship, and the law. Oh, now it's decided it won't do. I believe that uh, Britain was an Edenic land. It was a land of huge significance and very sacred. The British Isles are sacred isles. There has long been a tradition to send children to be educated here, still continued to this day. And while the teachings may have altered, some of the places to which they have been sent have not. And I believe it became manifest in some 5,000 years ago, which is really relatively recent, um, when some of the mounds were built, uh, same periods, uh, Mul uh, Merlin's Mound, Silbury Hill, and so on, when uh, it was continued through the Roman era, when there was interconnection with Rome. We went to Rome, the Romans came here. There was a lot of interaction between the two uh, civilizations. Um, and then into the Danish, the Saxon periods, and then from medieval times to the present era. Mm -hmm. Point it here. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's probably simple. Yeah, point it yeah, thank you. Uh, this map, you cannot see it, uh, unfortunately, but what it's got here, this is from a, a book I found on Atlantis, a marvelous uh, 1910 publication about Atlantis by a very visionary uh, man, part of the Theosophical Society, if you can read that. And they published this book and these maps. And it shows Atlantis, there is Atlantis, divided, but it was linked with this part of Europe, with Britain, the British Isles, and Scandinavia. This was a great big land mass here. Now, it's my belief, and I'm sure plenty of you people here uh, are obviously conscious of this fact that our knowledge, our information, our teachings may all have come from Atlantis, may have come from Lemuria, but I believe there were these civilizations of many, many thousands, maybe as Douglas Adams says, millions of years ago, where civilizations came and teachings came and then they went. Great cycles of time and that Britain lost it over a period of time and re-found it. And so part of my teaching, my, my research, uh, is that I'm learning the ancient, the ancient wisdoms are very much part of the land and the landscape. The mystery schools were known to be here. We think about mystery schools just being in Greece, um, uh, that, that sort of warm place. But no, they were very, very much here in this land. <coughs> and then Gorsets, as they became known in the sort of Welsh tradition, we called them Gorsets, but they were held, held all over Britain. Gorsets were held traditionally on or around uh, mounds, where Bardic teachings were given to initiates. Part of the Bardic teaching involved ritual, initiation, enacting of the lesser mysteries. <laughs> and the fundamental principles of ancient faiths that includes Zoroastrianism, Buddhism, 
Judaism and then later Christianity, and as Lisa said, the ancient teachings of Egypt are all very much part of the deep, the deeper spiritual teachings of these people. The laws of Moses uh, continued here in the fifth century were continued by the great lawgiver, an uh, ancient Briton called Malmutius. And he lived and reigned as king. In fact, he was our first known king uh, in about 400 BC. Um, and the Essenes taught here, the spirit of the sun gods linger still. This is Mary Kane's language. If you know about Mary Kane and her work with the zodiacs, the sun gods linger still in zodiac landscapes and, I believe, in the appearance of crop circles in Mother Earth. And uh, if any of you go to the crop circle conferences or follow, follow the crop circles, you'll know that many of them are full of symbolism of all the teachings that we've, we've ever had. Long before Caesar arrived in Britain, the Gauls had been sending their neophytes to Britain, <coughs> excuse me, for instruction, to prepare them for the higher soul life. As Rome burgeoned into a highly successful near-global power, their ruling families too sent sons and daughters to be educated here. <coughs> the Britons met the Romans as intellectual equals, and Shakespeare shows us this in Cymbeline. Those who wish to make a more assiduous study of Druidism generally go there to learn, Britain was regarded as sacred, an enclosure of the gods. The island of Britain is poised in the divine balance. What does that mean, in the divine balance? Isn't that a marvelous thing to feel, that this, these islands are held in the divine balance? And that was written by Gildas, the great uh, chronicler in the sixth century AD. <coughs> so, the Druidic connections I'm hot on, but in the 16th century, Michael Meyer uh, was a man understanding Rosicrucianism, uh, the early form of uh, Freemasonry, and he created a book of images, uh, esoteric images, and some of which depict England as the place of education and wisdom. <coughs> and I'll show you. Well, that's some water behind you there. Oh, thank you. I've got something. <coughs> <laughs> Actually, while you're perusing that, <coughs> this is the Atalanta Fugens emblem, 27. He who attempts to penetrate into the rose garden of the philosophers without the key, hmm. oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. <laughs> that's the next one. Right, so this one is the rose the English rose, the rose of England, long, long been a symbol of England. But more to the point, it's the rose giving <coughs> sweetness, honey, to the bee. And you see that there are actually two bees, one there and one there. And the bees are taking the honey to the hives. The hives are the people. They deserve, uh, the bees are, have long been a symbolism for uh, esoteric wisdom and here they are taking the wisdom from the English rose and taking it to the people. Now why I say it's the uh, symbolic of the uh, Rosicrucian, it's the cross here. You can hardly see it but there is the cross in the thorn of the stem. The stem north, south, west, east at uh, the base of this rose. A beautiful Rosicrucian symbol and then this is the one, the Atalata Fugens, uh, he who attempts to penetrate into the rose garden of the philosophers without the key resembles a man who would walk without feet. Um, now, here we have a, a man without feet, a rather odd, spooky image, barred and gated uh, door, and here is the garden of uh, philosophy and knowledge. But what I'm particularly interested in for my talk is this castle here and this mound here and uh, I have a close-up picture of them there's the castle very very like 
Windsor Castle, uh, with the, the tower. I mean, obviously, lot, lots of castles are like this, but it has a great similarity being that size and shape to Windsor. But look, here is a mound with what could be ancient Britons. There's some, somebody with a harp, uh, someone with a helmet and a spear that's very shaking the spear. But uh, up here looks like uh, women. Now, I don't really know how to explain that, except that I find it fascinating for my, for my study of why there's a connection between knowledge, learning, a castle, and a mound. And you'll see why in a minute. <coughs> this is a mound that is the first one I found. It's called the Eton Montem. And here is a ceremony of Eton boys r running up the mound. They climb up the mound, and the mound is still there. And here they are with putting a flag on the top. Uh, and in fact, royalty come to these uh, ceremonies. And here they are. I think this is about um, early, early 19th century, probably 1815, something like that. Here's the provost, and, and all the boys dressed in they dressed up in a sort of military wear, specifically for this event. Very strange. But look, there's the castle there. Great big castle that looks like um, St. George's Chapel. And there is the tower uh, over there. And here is the mound. This is how it is now. It's still called the Montem, and it still has uh, uh, a plaque to say it's a, it's a mound of 2600 BC. So they knew, they know, and they honour it. And thank God it's still there because. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I'm leaping ahead, but I, I'm showing you the four mounds I'm talking about. This is the mound on St Catherine's Hill in uh, Winchester. This is the mound, the uh, Merlin's Mound at Marlborough, uh, and this is the mound at Westminster, which doesn't exist. But I shall come on to that later. Uh, back to Eton. This is the mound now. As you can see, it's not particularly big. They have cut a chunk off, um, but it's by the skating rink and the whole sports centre. Slough is called uh, Slough uh, Montem Sports Centre. So they're still honouring my mound, thank God. Uh, here's some more pictures of it. As you can see, it's being fenced and kept safely. Um, now, the ceremony was this, Montem or Salt Hill was corrupted into Salt Hill. Now, this is a moot question for me. I'm not sure if salt is a significant enough aspect for it to have been called Salt Hill and Salt, uh, salt, salt Mound, or whether it was Sol or Sil, as in Silvery. But we'll come on to that later. Uh, piled up in remote antiquity, on the watery meads that environ the college, the Royal College, uh, the tun or sacred mound, formerly encircled by a stream, now partially, di partially diverted, was an E or island. Uh, hence the descriptive name of E Tom. And, not, and really, nobody knows that, that it was E Tom. It's only since 1840 when discontinued, uh, when the, sorry, the uh, tri triennial processions of the scholars to the Montem were discontinued, that the great seat has partly lost its original contour from a slice having been cut off the base to widen the road. Uh, the great interest of the Eton Gorset lies in that of Henry of Windsor, Holy Henry, Henry VI. Uh, 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 he was a very religious man, but he had this, com this connection with high, ancient high places of worship, ordained by statute that the memory of the solstitial festivals should be perpetuated by the scholars on the self-same site where in pre-Christian times the praises of the Most High had been celebrated by Druids. Now I don't know if you know this author. This is the most amazing book. I have it here. It's called Prehistoric London. And it's by an amazing uh, visionary <coughs> woman called Elizabeth Gordon, E.O. Gordon. Uh, I highly recommend it. I'm sure a lot of you know about it. Um, she's, she's a very wise and visionary person, as I say, and fully understands this connection with the very ancient 
ancient times. Um, this is uh, another unprepossessing photograph of Slough, but here is the top of the mound. You see they've built steps here. This is um, for access from the, from the other side. And of course, I'm afraid kids do go up and down on their bikes and things. Uh, but this is what I want to show you. This is, along here, the Great A4, the great road that leads eventually to Silbury Hill, to, to Marlborough Hill, to Silbury Hill, and of course on to Aqua, Aqua Sulis. 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 Yes, thank you, Aqua Sulis, uh, to Bath, and beyond possibly. And it's a very interesting thing that these are on this particular line of energy. Uh, so I had to show you this. This hill over here, this park, is actually called Salt Hill Park. So they're still using the word salt in their terminology here. So the earliest written account of Montem dates to 1561. That's all. It's, it was written about in 1561 in a book which I was lent, amazingly. I was able to read it. A very old book. Uh, so I went to Eton College and did a lot of research at the, uh, with the archivist. They call it the salt ceremony, and I'll tell you what this is. The, the custom involved a procession of scholars from Eton to the Montem, where the novices were sprinkled with salt, representing wit and learning. And I also learned that salt, as I'm sure Phil knows, is also representative of immortality in Druidic uh, burials, Druidic funerals. The origins of the custom are obscure, but the occasion was apparently an opportunity for reverie and dressing up. By the 18th century, the salt itself had become a pinch of salt, <laughs> uh, offered to passers-by in return for money, which was given to the senior king's scholar to maintain him at university. The university, of course, being King's Cambridge, which was a follow-on college from Eton. The two were built uh, in partnership, so it's a... Uh, um, the, the common thing was for the, for the uh, intelligent lads to, to, to go to Oxford to King's College. And of course, King's College Chapel is one of the most beautiful in the entire world. And the, co the chapel built at Eton was supposedly um, going to be as large as that. It never was. Uh, so, so the custom became something of a society event. In the 18th century, the royal court went and uh, figures three and four, which you've seen one, and here, I'll show you the next. But the disruption to school routine, increasing rowdyism of the boys, uh, became less acceptable, and they stopped it all in 1844. So there was no more <coughs> after 1844. A commemorative stone recently restored records this. Uh, it's no longer a commemorative stone. It's a um, plastic or acrylic sign. And here is Eton College, and here is Henry VI standing there in all his glory. That's a, um, a 16th century statue still there in the famous pebbled quad. And if it makes your hackles rise to see Eton boys in all their posh black and white costumes, uh, don't, because the whole plan of Eton was to create a school for uh, poor scholars. They were educated free. It was, I now know, that, I mean, if you know it's 38,000 pounds a minute or something, uh, it's all rather changed, but it was, and they do have scholars who are there not paying. So they do still have a system of this. But remember the 70 number is very significant. I just want to show you something else that I think is important. Up here, you can't see it, but that is um, a beautiful, extraordinary statue of the Virgin Mary, in a sense like, and I'll show you another picture later, of, of, of Isis. It's very like the symbol of Isis herself. Um, and as we'll see, oh, that's the original building, still there, that's on the other side from where we were, and that's the original, very plain um, and rather uncomfortable uh, school building, this one here. and. That's where they slept, and that's from the 15th century. And they all slept in one long, very cold dormitory. I think it must be terribly unpleasant. Uh, this is the founder, Henry VI, 
And he says, it's become a fixed purpose in our heart to found a college in honor and support of that our mother, the church, uh, in the parish church of Eton beside Windsor, not far from my birthplace. So it's symbolic that this is a, a feminine deity that he wants to be the mother of the church. And we'll see that it connects us. Here's a rather unclear picture of the charter. There is Henry himself, Holy Henry. Here is the Virgin Mary. Again, rather symbolically Isis-like. And this one too, this is the seal of Eton College. Look how much she's like Lisa's image of the uh, uh, Isis figure in Egypt. Uh, it's quite extraordinary, I think, this it could be a uh, Sybil or one of those early, early goddesses from thousands of years ago. And here's poor Henry. In the next seal, he's off the seal because Edward IV kills him and uh, takes over and has no interest in Eton whatsoever. So for about 50 years, nothing is done and the buildings are half finished. So it's a, it's a bit of a sad story. I mean, amazingly, it did actually continue and is still the most successful school in England. Here's the mound again, uh, and various pictures, and there's the castle. Um, here's, this, this is with George III, very popular king, and they, he loved the ceremony of going to the, the mound. Here he is with his queen, 1778. And there they all are, up, up on the mound there. There will be 70 boys up that mound. And again, 70 is important, 70 and two teachers uh, for the provost and the chaplain. So, and again with the castle in the background. But look, this is the most extraordinary thing. I discovered that all of Eton, all of Eton and its tradition is a mere copy. It was not Henry's idea at all. It was the idea of a man 50 years previously called William of Wickham from Winchester. And he created <coughs> this ceremony of going to hills, it was called, and it was 70 black clad schoolboys from the school he founded called St. Mary's of Winton. It just became Winchester College. And they climbed to the top of St. Catherine's Hill to the sacred mound at the top. Now I found this is the most extraordinary thing, that there he was eaten really second best, they won't admit it, <laughs> but a secondary, a second thought. Uh, here it is again, uh, you can see quite clearly that is a mound on top of the hill. And this is, I took this from the school itself. Again, I was able to go and do research there. Wonderful help, you know, they're very keen to help you, these people in, in these places. And you can just see, it's not that far to St. Catherine's Hill. In fact, it's, it's nearer than it is to uh, the Eton Mound. Oh, I missed to say, I should have said, that Wickham ordained that 70 black gown scholars ascend the Holy Hill twice daily. That was, that was in uh, uh, 40, about 14, 1420, and it was called Going to Hills. Um, I just want to say that the most extraordinary thing, the black gowns, uh, it, it turns out that the, uh, the cloth that they used at Eton actually came from Winchester. There, were extra there was a great friendship between those two schools. and uh, uh, They called it an amicabilis of Concordia in 1444. Uh, a friendship between the two colleges. Uh, and of course, William of Wickham had founded a new college, Cambridge. So they were kind of in a, in a, in a battle. And they, the cloth for the gowns came from Winchester. And a very druidic thing is that they had to be to the heels. And that was what they wore for this particular, in fact, they wear them still, and they are, they are their uniform. But it was particularly that they had to wear them to go to the, um, to go to the mound. So here we are. Uh, I just want to tell you a bit about Winchester. What an amazing town that is. It's uh, a city. It was a royal city. 
They are all royal cities, the ones I'm talking about today. They all have a connection with royalty and leadership. So, Standing Stones was what began at Winchester, leading into Druidic Temple, leading into Temple to Apollo in the Roman era, leading to the Temple to Thor in the Danish era. 648, the Old Minster was founded as Christianity became the religion and became the burial site of the Anglo-Saxon and Danish kings. In 827, King Alfred made Winchester his capital. In 1016, the Danish king Knut made it his capital and gave to the Old Minster a property of three hides called hills, one of which is the one on St. Catherine's Hill. Uh, 1066, William builds Winchester Castle, and in 1079, rebuilds the cathedral. So it's all connected with royalty uh, and with the church and leadership. The 10, 1086 Doomsday Book is compiled here. And Winchester was known as, variously, Wenta in ancient British, Caergwent, the Celtic term, Venta Belgara, <coughs> Roman, uh, Winchpan Kestra, <laughs> I'm sure that's not how you say it, uh, in Saxon times, and now uh, Winchester. In fact, that probably was how they said it uh, in the Saxon times. And here's William, this successful man. He actually, uh, he actually helped to build Windsor Castle. Ironically, he was connected very much with what was going on in the, um, in, in the monarchy. He was a stonemason. He, found, he founded Winchester College, but he called it St. Mary de Winton, again, dedicated to the feminine, as Eton was. So they know about the importance of the, the feminine power. Uh, 17 <coughs> scholars, faithful boys, who were taught the liberal arts. This is all quotes from the original uh, charter. And there is Winchester College, very, very similar of course, to Eton, because I think Henry VI just copied it. Here is the uh, motto, and of course it's, uh, you know, as they all are, it's got the, the garter symbology, and three English roses, uh, but this is the important thing, manners maketh man, which sounds so trite today, manners maketh man, what does that mean? Actually, manners, in the, in the period we're talking about, medieval England, meant morality, it's morals, it's not just politeness, I mean that's part of it, but it actually meant something much deeper than just manners. Uh, and morality and morals is really what this all boils down to. Uh, here's Winchester Castle, now of course this has this wonderful connection with uh, a later Roundel, uh, 1287, the Knights uh, of King Arthur Randall may be totally phony, but I don't think it's totally phony, but it is again a connection with Windsor where the actual Knights of the Garter ceremony was founded and still continues to this day, the most important ceremony of, of the land. Uh, the 13th century Great Hall at Winchester is a double cube. Now, I'm sure you all know about the double cube at Winton, at uh, Wilton House, quite separately, in uh, um, Inigo Jones' creation. But here, we know it was part of the Romano-British era where double square temples were, were known about. But the great man of Winchester, for me, is this man, Dumbelow Molmutius, 434 to 394 BC. He was the son of the Duke of Cornwall, which continues to be a royal dukedom today, and Prince Charles is the current duke. His wisdom, oh sorry, <laughs> his wisdom gave him the title of Solomon of Britain. Now again, is this the soul we were thinking about for Sol Hill, Salt Hill, or is it nothing to do with it? Is it a coincidence? Was he an initiate? As king of Lurgria, Britain, uh, he united the kingdom. He created the Molmutine laws, still in use to this day, and still considered the basic formation, foundation of English law to this day. He created roads across the land. 
That for me is hugely important because if he was creating roads pre-Roman, then this is pretty much fact that there we have it. The, the roads were built long before the Romans came, as I'm sure a number of you uh, feel too. He's the one mentioned in Cymbeline. Uh, Shakespeare writes, Mulmutius made our laws, who was the first king of Britain which did put his brows beneath a golden crown and called himself a king. So Mulmutius, whose statue, by the way, is <coughs> in, it's a very difficult statue to actually see close to, but it's above the doorway at the Guildhall in, in Winchester, if you should go, where they have statues of famous, famous people. And of course, his laws were based on the laws of Brutus. Uh, Brutus, uh, king of Britain around 1100 BC, uh, completely, uh, what's the word, made into fable and myth by modern uh, historians. <coughs> but if you believe, if you believe in uh, truth, you'll believe that King Brutus actually did come here. He was a king, and he did. Uh, come from uh, Aeneas. And he, he did actually found London, Pair Troia, that we know of, that became London. Now, St. Catherine's Hill, we're still on Winchester, but St. Catherine's Hill is famous for its mismaze. Mm -hmm. And this is it, this is a, a, a graphic drawing of it. As you can see, it's quite complex. Uh, it takes a long time to walk. We walked it last, uh, last autumn. Some of you know, here might have been there with us. And this is it as it is. And you can see miles around. And I thought, oh, that is seemed really important because, of course, the next school had a maze as well. And the next school is Westminster. So Westminster at Tothill had a mound that has been raised to the ground I think, do you know, I really believe there were many, many mounds over this landscape that have been raised to the ground. We just don't know that they're there, except if you find early maps or early um, <coughs> writings and references. So they had a mound here. Uh, in fact, they're known as Troy Town, as you probably know. They're known as Troy Town or uh, a Ms. Maze. And famously, this very school had had one, and this is the landscape as it was not that long ago, ironically. I mean, this is a Victorian watercolour, uh, very, very uh, rural indeed. Uh, this is a slightly later map, and as you see, it's called Playground for the Westminster Scholars. And somebody pointed out to me that where, what all these schools have in common is that they go for the map to the mound for play, for fun. And I thought, how lovely that the very area where the mound was and the boys went to is now their playground. But still, the Horse Ferry Road is still, is still there, is still there to this day, linking up the bridge from, from the river. So it was a very important crossing place. And if you've read, well, a number of books mention it being a very important sacred place. Well, of course, Westminster. Oh, there is the playing field as it is today. So just to show you how it's still used as a playing field. And here's the school. Uh, that's a much more recent building. It was founded by Henry VIII. Uh, and actually Queen Elizabeth then took, uh, took the sort of uh, reins of it and made it her school. And it was, of course, you know, practically next door to her her palace then of uh, the Hall of Westminster Palace from uh, the Normans <coughs> was here. Isn't that St. Stephen's Hall? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, so it is. So it is. Well, then this is the one. <coughs> this is showing where the site of the palace. And of course, it was the most amazing palace, apparently, very, very luxurious. but. She didn't really like living there, and I think very quickly she chose her other palaces of um, Nonsuch and Richmond and Windsor to live in. But it was the royal palace. So there we have the connection with leadership, Westminster, our government, 
uh, royalty, the queen, and uh, the law, the law being made at, at Westminster. So very much a link. Here's the one school where the mound is much, much older than the school itself. Well, of course, all the mounds are older. But this mound, again, 2600 BC, the same age as Silbury, and Silbury is just down the road. The school is much more modern and was actually created for the sons of clergy originally. And now, of course, it's a very successful mixed school. This, oh, what a bad picture. This is down the road, uh, the greatest, biggest mound in possibly the world, certainly in Europe. And here's a diagrammatic picture. Oh, you can't see it. Sorry about that. Uh, there, it's about that difference, but the same dimensions uh, uh, relatively. And they did find, uh, the, the um, archaeologists quite recently found it really was from 5000 BC. It was used as a royal castle itself. They actually built the castle on the mound. Uh, 1290, that particular picture is, if you can see that. Um, and the, the castle was used by various kings from um, Henry II, Henry III, uh, Stephen, uh, Matilda, Eleanor of uh, Aquitaine. They were very, they loved it. I'm not surprised they loved it, it's beautiful. And they all, they all used it. In fact, Eleanor uh, created rather more glamorous and beautiful rooms at the castle. So there was a royal, there was a school, it wasn't a school then, but it was the castle and the mound. And what's more I found uh, very important was that here was King Henry III <coughs> creating the Statute of Winchester. I'd never heard of the Statute of Winchester. But it's a law that has never been repealed to this very day. It's one of the few laws that hasn't been repe repealed. And the Treasury of England was here. And this statute says small, it gives, uh, gave rights and privileges to small landowners and limited the feudal rights of kings to take possession of the land. So it's, it's as it were, a, a follow-on from the earlier Magna Carta, which had been about 50 years previous to this. Uh, and what <coughs> I want to show is that this is um, Lord Otterbahn, who became Pope, became Pope Adrian the V. So uh, obviously uh, became a you know a high high person in the Roman Catholic Church. And this is the lovely Richard, uh, the Duke of Cornwall. And the reason I love Richard, Duke of Cornwall, is because he created a palace at Asda. And this particular palace is called Sippenham Palace, and it is right by Asda. So he had his own corner shop. <laughs> uh, and there he is with his lovely um, Knights Templar helmet, uh, looking extremely uh, forthright as he was. But yes, he built this castle at Sydenham, believe it or not. And Sydenham is about a mile and a half due west of Eton Montem. So <clears throat> for me, it, it's a, it's a, he's no, he knows a thing or two. He also created the School of Bonhomme, if you know about the Bonhommes, at um, Ash, Ashridge connected with Berkhamsted Castle. So he was very, very into things that were connected with the Knights Templar, connected very much with uh, the esoteric aspect of, of uh, religion. Uh, here's uh, just back to um, Marlborough Mound again, to show how it was, in fact, after the castle was uh, taken down, they made a sort of rather glamorous garden and a hotel, and it became a stopping place for those on the Great Bath Road going to Bath in the uh, sort of 18th century. But I want to show you this shell enrichment program, just because I'm interested in this walking to places. <clears throat> I believe that's shell as in the oil company, but never mind. 
The enrichment program for the shell, year nine, gives pupils a sense of place. They are encouraged to consider the school in its cultural and historical context, both within the setting of Marlborough Town and the Wiltshire landscape. In the first term, all shell pupils walk across the downs from Avebury back to the college, starting at the Great Stone Circle and following the Heropath, the Saxon military road over the Chalk Farm. And this comes from the school uh, uh, website, so this is official. I, I believe uh, I, the Heropath is much older than a Saxon military road. I think it's one of those great routes. It's the Ridgeway. It's part of the Ridgeway. It sort of moves off from Avebury along the Ridgeway and then down and around down to Avebury. To the Montem, that's my, that's my theory. So in a sense, the Shell Enrichment Programme is, is, is continuing my, uh, my belief. I mean, the term Shell uh, is, comes from remove. Uh, the calling the juniors, they are held as they were protected. Ah, and when they you. move up, they are removed from the shell. This is where the term oh. removed comes from, the shell. Oh, that's yeah. lovely. Thank you very much. We'll have to come and pick your brains later. So the, the, let's look at the aims of each school and see if there is a comparison here. Uh, uh, students are encouraged... Uh, I'm just going to leap ahead here. Students are encouraged to think for themselves while developing sensitivity to religious, moral, spiritual issues and respect for the beliefs and values of others. This is for a school who was founded for the sons of clergy. So this is really quite open-minded. And of course it's, by, it's uh, for both sexes now. Uh, a triple foundation of compassion, companionship and conversation. Through these pupils are encouraged to explore their talents, potential and aspirations. If you know about the, the uh, more mutine laws, they were all in threes. The druidic um, uh, aims and um, morals are all in threes as well. And Westminster. I'm sorry to be leaping around with our schools. <coughs> if you can just think Westminster, the one at Tot Hill. Uh, pupils are encouraged to think for themselves to question and argue in a way that genuinely stretches their minds. It's about being a, uh, you know, an, an, uh, thinking out of the box. <coughs> when the boys and girls leave Westminster, they emerge informed, <coughs> articulate, and well able to hold their own intellectually. At the same time, people should not feel weighed down by impossible academic burdens. I love that. I'd have been much happier if my convent had been more liberal. Okay, back to uh, Marlborough, old Marlburians. They had lots of bishops, that's not surprising, uh, an archbishop, two chief justices, two law lords, and unique figures, Anthony Blunt, uh, John Betjeman, William Morris, Siegfried Sassoon, uh, Princess Eugenie of York, and all the Middletons, and of course, most famously, Kate. But what I have said here is, oops, oh, there she is, <laughs> uh, that the, they all, they, the, it has its own Masonic Lodge. And then I found out that they all have their own Masonic Lodge, each one of them. So I think that's a, a, a nice connection. And there she is at school looking very happy. So old Etonians, uh, they had bishops, of course, Lord Chancellors, <coughs> Prime Ministers, from the Duke of Wellington to David Cameron. <laughs> Ran of Fines, Bear Grylls, all these kind of brave people, Eddie Redmayne and Tom Hiddleston, great actors of our day, royalty from the Aga Khan to Princes William and Harry, and there he is looking rather dishy there. And good look, he's the son of the current Duke of Cornwall. I think it's wonderful, this link with the Earldom of Cornwall, it's very, very important. You know, this goes back to when there were these divisions, the son of Brutus, the <coughs> sons of Brutus created Cornwall and Locria and uh, um, Scotland. So, uh, so we're talking about links with very, very ancient past. Old oh, Wickhamists, that's uh, Westminster, no, that's Winchester, Archbishops of Canterbury, two Lord Chancellors, Labour politicians this time, um, including Heath Gatesville. But mostly artistic names, Nicholas Udall and Thomas Coriat in the 16th century, 
to Anthony Trollope and Tim Brooke Taylor. Actually, I love the fact that Nicholas Udall went there. He then became a headmaster of Eton. And when he was headmaster of Eton, he wrote the first ever comedy for stage called Ralph Royster Doyster, as I'm sure a lot of you know. And they performed it at Eton. And then, of course, it became, you know, it was published, it was <coughs> reprinted about a thousand times. Very successful writer. So the ethos of Eton has always been in drama. And to this day, if you hear an interview with um, uh, Tom, either Tom Hiddleston or, or um, who was the other actor I mentioned? Eddie Redmayne. Eddie Redmayne. They all say, we, we, we thank our teachers at Eton for the drama input. Very, very good high standard of drama. Uh, okay, uh, back to Winchester. Winchester College aims to encourage, train, and form confident, enthusiastic, well-rounded adults with strong ethical sense and respect for the life of the mind, at ease with relationships with other people, whatever the circumstances. So again, it's all very, very kind of liberal. Uh, old Westminsters include John Dee's son. It's not interesting that John Dee's son went there at a time when most people were privately educated. Ben Johnson, George Herbert, Christopher Wren, uh, Prime Minister, mm -hmm. John Gielgud, Peter Ustinov, lots of uh, important people, and Nick Clegg, and Dido. Uh, the spirit of moral, we're back to moral again, moral manners. And spiritual reflection is deeply embedded within its educational tradition. And they emerge, they emerge informed, articulate, and well able to hold their own intellectually. And that is, again, from the current headmaster. Now, this is, this is really a bit of fun, but I thought, it can't just be those four schools that have connections with a mound. So I looked at Harrow, mm -hmm. and of course, it's what a bloody great mound. <laughs> but I don't think that's a man-made mound. I think it's a natural hill, um, and the actual school and the church is on top of it. And I haven't researched enough into Harrow, so I've not included it in my talk. <clears throat> but I want to show you partly because geographically this is this is the area I'm looking at. So there's Marlborough. Uh, Eton is just north of Windsor, so it's all in that line to Westminster. Uh, and the line would carry on to Bath and possibly eastwards to St. Paul's, and I got to research that with Rob's help. Uh, so here's just a close-up close picture of it, except you still can't see the line, I'm afraid. But it's a beautiful right-angle triangle. Marlborough, Westminster, Winchester, Marlborough. So here is a beautiful uh, right-angle triangle. Now, if you've all read Gary Bookcliffe's book, you know that there is a long connection with kind of geomancy and energy lines going right through Winchester. It's a pilgrim's route also to Kent, as I'm sure you, you, you know about that aspect. Uh, oh, and of course there's a mound at Lewis, as uh, Philip once, once taught us. Uh, so just looking at the expression to the hill, add Montem from Eton to the hill. I put hills, but it actually is hill, singular. Winchester to the hills. Westminster, I think, to the hill, is what Tot Hill <coughs> really is. And Marlborough, I think the pilgrimage along that ancient route back to their mound is similar to, it could be subtitled, to the hill. Now I'm just going to touch on Windsor Castle because that's also on a mound, a man-made mound. And they don't really excavate it, I'm afraid. It's rather disappointing. But you can go around the tower now. Um, here it is, an aerial view. There is the mound. There is the tower, now built up. And that was built up uh, some period ago. Here is the amazing St. George's Chapel, home of the great ceremony of the garter. And here, in this part here, was where the time team, Tony Robbins lot, found the most amazing uh, um, circle for Nights to to sit in. And it was. Can you remember the number? It was a huge number of nights that originally were thought of, and it only lasted about twenty years. And then 
he decided to make it a smaller group of 12 knights for the, for the garter. And so that slightly uh, created this shift. But there's the area again where this, the site of where this round table, Arthurian table officially, was at Windsor. Uh, here's, oh God, it was cold that day. <laughs> Everything was covered in frost. But here's the mound again and the tower. But why I've taken this now is to show you that just below it, see there's, there's the mound and the tower, is this amazing uh, eight-pointed star that was created by Prince Charles. Now to me, that is, that is, I mean, that could be almost taken from ancient Egypt. It really is wonderful that he has seen fit to create, and there's a beautiful rose garden there as well. So it's kind of rose and cross time. He's, I think he's a secret rose inclusion of our Charles. So I, I thought I'd look around the castle for Druidic symbology, as it were, and here is the Hearn Oak. And I went to this about 10 years ago. I was very lucky to have met somebody who worked at the castle and um, she took me there. And there I am standing rather proudly uh, with this sign of the Herno being on the site of the original Herno, because there have been arguments about it. But they say this is the actual place. It was built, it was um, planted some you know, uh, um, about 150 years ago, so it's not, it's not ancient, but the site is ancient. Uh, and in fact, I stole a bit. There it is, my piece of very important Herm Oak from Windsor. But I just want to read you what they gave me in the, in the library about the importance of the Herm Oak to the royal family. In Victoria's day, <clears throat> When the King of Prussia arrived for the christening of the Prince of Wales in 1853, the first object of their attention, this is the whole family of Europe coming together, the, the first object of their attention, curiosity, and veneration was the Herm Oak. Uh, the splendors of the castle were objects of inferior interest compared to a single time destroyed withered tree, as it probably was in 53. On arrival, they gazed at it in silence, but each of the party gathered a leaf, which they intended to carry back to their own country, to be shown there as one of no common interest. So I think they have known of the importance of the Druid connection in their family for hundreds of years. And I think it goes underground and then it comes up with people like Prince Charles. Uh, and here, finally, just to show, back to our Eton Montem, you may think it's rather odd that they dress up in these strange uh, outfits, fancy dress, as it were, and a lot of them did wear peculiar fancy dress. Um, it still happens to this day. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is the Eton boys doing their boating. They have a boating tradition and they all have to stand up in the punt, extremely dangerous, and they all wear these extraordinary, uh, their mother's hats, probably. <laughs> so there we are. It, it is really, um, I think that's the last one. It really is a, a kind of ongoing research, and if anybody has thoughts and ideas on how to further it and where to take it, I'd be delighted to hear from you. Thank you very much. <laughs> is that there is a link between very ancient teachings, uh, Druidism, and what they're teaching today in our schools. 
in some of our schools. Uh, so I just wanted to read a little bit from this book of uh, Druidism, which I just got in the post yesterday and managed to read extraordinarily uh, fast. But children were taken away from homes and educated many, many, many years ago. Um, Druids uh, educated all children of whatever station, not permitting their parents to receive them till they were 14 years of age. Thus the Druids were regarded as the real fathers of the people. I'm sorry you can't read this very clearly, but it says, what are the special links between the ancient mounds of Eton Winchester, Westminster, and Marlborough. There seem to be curious connections between these mounds. They're all connected to unique places of education. And each has a link with, and this is my point, leadership, kingship, and the law. Oh, now it's decided it won't do. I believe that uh, Britain was an Edenic land. It was a land of huge significance and very sacred the images, uh, esoteric images, and some of which depict England as the place of education and wisdom. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'll show you. Well, that's the water behind you there. Oh, thank you. I've got something. <coughs> Actually, while you're perusing that, <coughs> this is the Atalanta Fugins emblem, 27. He who attempts to penetrate into the rose garden of the philosophers without the key... Hmm. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. <laughs> that's the next one. Right, so this one is the rose, the English rose, the rose of England, long, long been a symbol of England. But more to the point, it's the rose giving sweetness, honey, to the bee. And you see that there are actually two bees, one there and one there. And the bees are taking the honey to the hives. The hives are the people. They deserve, uh, the bees are, have long been a symbolism for uh, esoteric wisdom. And here they are taking the wisdom from the English rose and taking it to the people. Now, why I say it's uh, symbolic of uh, Rosicrucian, it's a cross here. You can hardly see it, but there is a cross in the thorn of the stem. The stem, north, south, west, east, uh, the base of this rose. A beautiful Rosicrucian symbol. And then this is the one, the Atalata Fugians. Uh, he who attempts to penetrate into the rose garden of the philosophers without the key resembles a man who would walk without feet. Um, now, here we many thousands, maybe as Douglas Adams says, millions of years ago, where civilizations came and teachings came and then they went. Great cycles of time, and that Britain lost it over a period of time and re-found it. And um, so part of my teaching, my, my research, uh, is that I'm learning the ancient the ancient wisdoms are very much part of the land and the landscape. The mystery schools were known to be here. We think about mystery schools just being in Greece, um, uh, that, that sort of warm place, but no, they were very, very much here in this land. <coughs> and then Gorseths, as they became known in the sort of Welsh tradition, we called them gorsets, but they were hold, held all over Britain. Gorsets were held traditionally on or around mound, uh, mounds where bardic teachings were given to initiates. Part of the bardic teaching involved ritual, initiation, enacting of the lesser mysteries. <coughs> and the fundamental principles of ancient faiths, that includes Zoroastrianism, Buddhism, Judaism and, and later Christianity, and as Lisa said, the ancient teachings of Egypt are all very much part of the deep, the deeper spiritual teachings of these people. The laws of Moses 
uh, continued here in the fifth century, were continued by the great lawgiver, <coughs> an ancient Briton called Molmutius. And he lived and reigned as king. In fact, he was our first known king uh, in about 400 BC. Um, and the Essenes taught here, the spirit of the sun gods linger still. This is Mary Kane's language. If you know about Mary Kane and her work with the zodiacs, the sun gods linger still in zodiac landscapes and, I believe, in the appearance of crop circles in Mother Earth. And uh, if any of you go to the crop circle conferences or follow, follow the crop circles, you'll know that many of them are full of symbolism of all the teachings that we've, we've ever had. Long before Caesar arrived in Britain, the Gauls had been sending their neophytes to Britain, <coughs> excuse me, for instruction to prepare them for the higher soul life. As Rome burgeoned into a highly successful near global power, their ruling families too sent sons and daughters to be educated here. <coughs> the Britons met the Romans as intellectual equals, and Shakespeare shows us this in Cymbeline. Those who wish to make a more assiduous study of Druidism generally go there to learn. Britain was regarded as sacred, an enclosure of the gods. The island of Britain is poised in the divine balance. What does that mean, in the divine balance? Isn't that a marvelous thing to feel, that this, these islands are held in the divine balance? And that was written by Gildas, the great uh, chronicler in the 6th century AD. <coughs> so, the Druidic connections I'm hot on, but in the 16th century, Michael Meyer uh, was a man understanding Rosicrucianism, uh, the early form of uh, Freema Freemasonry, and he created a book of the British Isles are sacred isles. There has long been a tradition to send children to be educated here, still continued to this day. And while the teachings may have altered, some of the places to which they have been sent have not. And I believe it became manifest in, in uh, some 5,000 years ago, which is really relatively recent, um, when some of the mounds were built, uh, same period, uh, Mul uh, Merlin's Mound, Silbury Hill, and so on, when uh, it was continued through the Roman era, when there was interconnection with Rome, we went to Rome, the Romans came here. There was a lot of interaction between the two uh, civilizations. Um, and then into the Danish, the Saxon periods, and then from medieval times to the present era. Uh, point it here. Yes, it's probably simple. Yeah, point it yeah thank you. Uh, this map, you cannot see it, uh, unfortunately, but what it's got here, this is from a, a book I found on Atlantis, a marvellous uh, 1910 publication about Atlantis by a very visionary uh, man, part of the Theosophical Society, if you can read that. And they published this book and these maps, and it shows Atlantis, there is Atlantis divided, but it was linked with this part of Europe, with Britain, the British Isles and Scandinavia. This was a great big land mass here. Now, it's my belief, and I'm sure plenty of you people here uh, are obviously conscious of this fact, that our knowledge, our information, our teachings may all have come from Atlantis, may have come from Lemuria, but I believe there were these civilizations of many, 